So just a quick outline. I'm going to first look at how we're doing in our support of education in developing countries. I'm then going to look very briefly at some of the challenges that are faced in these countries. I'm going to look at the debate around quality versus access when it comes to supporting education here. Um, I've got a few ideas on how to improve quality of education and they again relate to the presentations that come later on today. And then we're going to look at some suggestions for best practice. So firstly, how do we know if the education programmes we are running or supporting are successful? Well, one way is to look at the Millennium Development Goals and see how the countries we are partnering are doing in these goals. Now, a very quick overview, there are eight of these. They were adopted by world leaders in 2000 to be achieved by 2015 um, um, to provide concrete numerical benchmarks for tackling extreme poverty in all its dimensions. They provide a framework for the international community to work together to make sure that human development reaches everyone, everywhere. If these goals are achieved, world poverty will be cut by half, tens of millions of lives will be saved, and billions of people will have the opportunity to benefit from global economy. So a great set of goals that we should all look to achieving as a world together. MDG2 is the tool used to measure progress in education, and it says it's to achieve universal primary education. It sets out to ensure that boys and girls all over the world will be able to complete a full cycle of primary education. This education is free and it should be compulsory. MDG2 is showing signs of success. You can see on the slide 83% of developing countries are either on or close to achieving this target. That meaning that all children are attending the full cycle of primary education. But there are issues. There are still millions of children not even attending school. In 2009, it's biggest of 77 million children still out of school. And there are still inequalities. The vulnerable are the most affected. Girls, disabled students, and the very poor are still not attending school in any form. 19 countries are way behind on the target. Uh, countries such as Mali, the DRC, Sudan, and Malawi. But let's have a look at one of the countries that is supposed to be on target um, and therefore demonstrate what achieving, achieving the Millennium Development Goal actually means for that target and what it means for these as a whole. So let's have a look at Tanzania. In Tanzania, enrolment has reached 95.5%, which is a fantastic achievement and one they should be very proud of. Since 2001, they have built 4,266 primary schools, which again is fantastic, a 355% increase in primary schools built in Tanzania. And the government is obviously on board and recognises how important education is for lifting their country out of poverty. They've committed £750 million pounds to the education budget. That's across the whole but, um, education sector, not just primary school. And the, the table below demonstrates that. However, what does this actually mean? They've got lots of children in school. They're achieving the Millennium Development Goal. Got fantastic access. But what does that actually mean when it comes to learning outcomes? What are the children learning? Well, that graph shows that actually attainment is decreasing in Tanzania. So since 2000, it slight, slightly rose to up to 2003, and since then it's been on a rapid decrease. So the graph shows that as financing, enrollment and infrastructure increases, attainment is decreasing. WESO is a education uh, research group, again in Tanzania, and they did a study across the country um, and looked at different groups of students. They used standard two national tests to test how children were progressing throughout the education system. 
They chose tests in Kiswahili, which is the national language, in English, which is a subject all the way through school, and in simple mathematics. And they used these standard two tests to test standard three children. So in theory, the standard three children should do very well at these tests for the year below their level. But as you can see, only a quarter can read level two Kiswahili. Only a third can perform standard two level maths. So these children are not performing up to their levels. So attainment is not so good. They're in school, but they're not attaining. What happens in standard seven? So standard seven is when the children have completed their entire compulsory primary school education. In theory, they should be getting 100% on these tests. But whereas you use the same test, the same exact standard two tests, to test standard seven children. Still, the results are not that brilliant. Only three quarters of them can read standard two level Kiswahili, and only a half read standard two level English. The English is important because secondary and further education is all in English. The textbooks, the exams, the media of instruction is all in English. So if children do want to carry on with their education, they're going to struggle if only half of them can actually understand the language the education is delivered in. It's also the language of government, mass media, and the judiciary. So it's a very important language for children to learn. In summary, the Deputy Minister of Education in 2011 stated that illiteracy increased in Tanzania from 11% in 1986 to 31% in 2010. So despite success in, in MDG2, with increasing enrollment and infrastructure, Tanzania's children are not receiving a good education. Illiteracy is increasing. So success in universal primary education does not equate to an education that equips learners with the basic skills needed to develop their own lives. What else do these higher levels of enrollment or access mean in terms of the challenges that education systems face? Well, what really happens is that available resources do not match the learner numbers. And that equates to very high teacher-pupil ratios, high pupil-book ratios, lack of trained teachers, poor infrastructure, all leading to a high level of dropouts and repetition. And basically a very inefficient system that produces students that have not reached a level of attainment that they should when they've had seven years of primary education. This is a classroom in Malawi, where I was in September, with 314 pupils for one teacher. As you can see, there's no desks, there's no chairs, and there's no books. So it's great the children are in school, but what are they actually learning? So all these leads to low levels of attainment due to a very poor quality education. Therefore, it's problematic to equate success in MDG2 as a measure of a well-functioning education system. The overriding problem with the state of success in MDG2 is that it focuses on access, enrollment, resource provision, and infrastructure. We need to ask ourselves how we succeeded in MDG2 if a child finishes seven years of primary education and is still not able to read in their country's dominant language or perform simple maths. Two skills that are considered essential if a person is to develop and grasp opportunities to create the cycle of poverty they might find themselves in. Best practice provided by Scottish NGOs must include and reflect upon quality as well as bums on seats in order to better support education systems in developing countries. I mentioned quality a lot, but what does this actually mean? Well, three education providers define it slightly differently, but they're all looking really at the same thing. So UNESCO, education should allow children to reach their fullest potential in terms of cognitive, emotional, and creative capacities. Say the children, the education should be relevant and appropriate. So relevant means to their local context. Appropriate means to the learner's needs. Participatory, flexible, inclusive, and protective. 
the Haki Alimu, which is a leading education NGO in Tanzania. Haki Alimu means um, right to education. And they define it as something that promotes learners' capacity, confidence, curiosity, inquiry, and creativity. So how might we support the delivery of a quality education? Well, these are some issues that we can look at to name just four, and these happen to be the ones that we're looking at um, after this presentation. So we can look at teacher training. We can equip teachers with the skills to manage large classrooms, assess progress, understand curriculum, use current pedagogy, develop leadership and manage abilities to improve classroom and school practices and therefore the outcomes of the learners. We can engage the community in supporting the school and that doesn't just need financial support. Um, but also by teaching parents about the value of education, the value of sending their girls to school and not marrying them off early, of the value of basic skills to increase their children's chances of moving beyond the poverty cycle. Malawi has a great example of mother groups, and this is a government initiative where um, every community has a mother who is a member of a group who encourages girls who have dropped out of school to go back to school by counselling the girl, by counselling the parents, and, and teaching them about the value of education. We can measure and evaluate school performance to show school and district and national governments where the strengths and weaknesses are so gaps can be filled with the minimal resources available. The same goes for measuring the impact of our education programmes so we can see where the gaps are. If we can't fill the gaps, we should partner with another organisation who can. And we can include all. Real inclusion means including all those children out of school, the girls, the disabled, the sick, the ethnic minorities, the orphans, the desperately poor, so that every child has equity in opportunity. These elements are some that will enable progress towards a real move to improving the quality of education for all, and it will be discussed later on in this presentation. But how might we measure if the ways we as NGOs supporting education having an impact. Bond and Nigel are in the process of developing indicators that can help educational organisations measure their impact, thus enabling them to ensure they are supporting the delivery of a quality education which is accessible to all. These include ensuring government support, ensuring schools are well managed and resourced, ensuring the teaching is of good quality, all children are included and communities are engaged. By using these indicators, NGOs can ensure their presence <coughs> are impacting education in the most useful and meaningful ways. But what do we consider is best practice? We think best practice involves these elements, at, at least these elements. Best practice should be holistic and focus on access and quality. Focus only on increasing the numbers of children in schools leads to rising numbers of children in poorly resourced classrooms with not enough teachers. The example given was Tanzania. The quality definition will show that supporting education in developing countries must be more than just improving in enrollment figures. Teachers must be adequately trained, communities engaged, and all children included. If an organisation specialises in just one aspect, e.g. teacher training or school feeding, then it should be their responsibility to ensure that the other quality aspects are being considered and that their own impact does not detrimentally affect the quality of education the children are receiving. Organisations could partner up in Scotland and or with organisations or governments in host countries to ensure a holistic approach is being taken. Programmes should be sustainable, beyond the input of the donor. Providing textbooks, supplying school meals, building classrooms, or sending notebooks and pens from Scotland to Africa all enable education, but only for one generation of children. <coughs> they are not sustainable and often exacerbate the donor dependency that we should all be moving away from. Africa has textbooks, pens, notebooks and cups. They do not need ours. 
What is sustainable is supporting capacity building to ensure lessons learned produce better outcomes from one generation to the next. A strong needs analysis before programmes begin ensure what we offer is needed and does not deflect from other more pressing educational priorities a government may have identified and may have requested help with. Why set up a programme sending textbooks to Africa when African countries have publishing houses, printers, writers, illustrators capable of making their own books relevant to their own needs whilst boosting their own economy? Wouldn't it be better to capacity build these skills in country and then focus support in areas of real need, such as training teachers in special education, educational needs for disabled children? And lastly, by supporting strong national priorities that enable a whole district to implement a programme, followed with strong monitoring, evaluation and learning, enables far-reaching impact and not a focus within one community or village. This gives better value for money and resources, builds capacity across a wider spectrum of people and results in greater impact. If all our programmes contained all of these elements, then support to our partner countries would be more valuable, more contextual, and importantly, more useful. Thank you.